There's an old airplane story that's called the LA Speed Check. It goes something like this. A, a pilot of a single-engine Cessna calls the Los Angeles Air Route Control Center and asks for a speed check. He wants to know how fast he's going, and the center tells him he's going about 90 knots. Immediately thereafter, another pilot, someone in, say, a twin-engine Beechcraft, trying to make fun of how slow the Cessna goes, asks for a speed check, and the center tells him that he's going around 121 knots. But almost immediately thereafter, another voice chimes in, and this is a Navy pilot who's flying in an F-18 fighter jet, and he doesn't really need to know how fast he's going. He's got an airspeed indicator inside his cockpit. He's just trying to prove to everybody out there on the frequency that he's flying the biggest, baddest, fastest jet in the world, and show all those Cessna on Beechcraft owners how fast our plane really flies, and the, the LA Center radios back that he's going a, an impressive 620 knots, and you think that would be enough to win this little contest, when another voice casually asks, this is Aspen 30, can you give us a speed check? And after a moment, the Center responds, Aspen 30, we have you going 1,993 knots. That story, which was related in Brian Scholl's book Sled Driver, Flying the World's Fastest Jet, shows how extreme the world's fastest air-breathing manned jet aircraft in history, the Lockheed SR-71 Blackbird, really was. But, you know, if you fly in an airplane that can go more than three times the speed of sound and almost into outer space, one thing's important. You don't want to fall out. And if you did, it would be history that deserves to be remembered. In late 1957, the CIA approached the defense contractor Lockheed, asking them to secretly design an undetectable spy plane. The project, called Archangel, was to be handled by the Lockheed Advanced Development Projects team, led by legendary aircraft engineer Kelly Johnson. Lockheed's Advanced Development Project Unit was called the Skunk Works, a, a nickname it had gotten since the original facility had been built near an old plastics manufacturing plant that produced awful smells. In 1955, the Skunk Works had gotten a CIA contract to build an ultra-high-altitude spy plane designed for flying over the Soviet Union and photographing sites of strategic interests. The plane was the Lockheed U-2, a plane able to fly at such a high altitude that it was thought to be outside Soviet radar capacity and invulnerable to Soviet fighter aircraft and ground-to-air missiles. The new request was for a plane that could go even higher and faster than the U-2. The need for such a plane was highlighted when a Soviet S-75 ground-to-air missile successfully shot down a U-2 in May of 1960, causing an international incident. Project Archangel produced a single-seat reconnaissance plane called the A-12 and a two-seat fighter interceptor prototype called the YF-12 that set speed and altitude records in 1965. While the F-12 never made production, it was used as a model for an Air Force reconnaissance plane that was longer than the A-12, held more fuel, and had a two-seat cockpit. The plane ended up with the designation SR for Strategic Reconnaissance 71. Painted a blue so dark that it was almost black to camouflage the plane against the night sky, it earned the nickname Blackbird. A total of 36 SR-71 Blackbirds were manufactured. The SR-71 was designed for flight at over Mach 3, with a flight crew of two, the pilot in the forward cockpit, and the reconnaissance systems officer operating the surveillance systems and equipment from the rear cockpit, and directing navigation on the mission flight path. Traveling at supersonic speeds meant that the outside of the aircraft would get very hot, more than 600 degrees, so Lockheed could not use aluminum. The plane was 92% titanium, inside and out. While titanium has low density and high strength, it offers unique challenges in manufacturing. But most problematic is that the ore needed to make titanium is rare and in short supply in the United States. The major supplier of the ore was the Soviet Union. The U.S. surreptitiously worked through third world straw buyers to acquire the ore. The plane was designed to reduce its radar cross-section, an early version of stealth. That combined with its speed and altitude made the plane virtually invulnerable to countermeasures. The SR-71 was powered by two Pratt & Whitney J-58 engines. This axial flow turbojet engine was designed to be most efficient at speed Mach 3.2, although later experience showed that it may have been even more efficient at higher speeds. But there was a complex problem at those speeds. Air coming inside the engine had to be slowed to subsonic speeds to maintain consistent flow to the compressor. This was done by moving a cone that was called a spike inside each inlet. But as the airflow reduces, it causes a disturbance, a shockwave called normal shock. An analog computer within the engine would control a complex system of bleed tubes and bypass doors to handle the pressure. 
However, the early analog computers would often have difficulty keeping up with rapidly changing flight conditions. If the pressure inside the engine became too great, it could blow back out the front of the engine, disrupting airflow in what was called an inlet unstart. The unstart initially causes immense drag because of the forward blowback and would often extinguish the afterburner, causing asymmetrical thrust and violent yaw. Inputs from the autopilot system and the pilot could counter the yawing, recapture the shockwave, and return the plane to normal operation. But an unstart would almost always result in a rough ride, sometimes accompanied by violent banging noises and counter yawing. The yawing could be so violent that the pilot's helmets would bang against the canopy. The effect was described as like being in a train wreck. There were also challenges given the plane's altitude ceiling, above 80,000 feet. A normal pilot's mass cannot provide enough oxygen for a pilot above about 40,000 feet, and breathing becomes impossible above 49,000 feet, as the pressure at which the lungs excrete carbon dioxide exceeds outside air pressure. At 62,000 feet, some 18 plus kilometers, the pressure reaches something called the Armstrong limit. Named after the pioneering flight physician who identified the phenomena, the Armstrong limit represents the altitude above which atmospheric pressure is sufficiently low that water boils at the normal temperature of the human body. Simply put, a human cannot survive above this limit, as their blood would literally boil. To withstand the conditions, air crews for high altitude craft have to wear pressurized suits. In the terrible scenario where an aircrew had to eject at extreme altitudes, the suit had a built-in oxygen tank designed to keep the suit pressurized. The SR-71's performance would subject it to extreme conditions. Planes returning from missions often would have rivets ripped out, or panels that were delaminated, or parts like air intakes that had to be repaired or replaced. And one place where the extreme conditions that affected this airplane showed was in aircraft losses. Of just 32 SR-71s built, 12 were lost to accidents, and the first of those accidents occurred during the plane's testing phase on January 25th, 1966. The plane, tail number 952, took off from Edwards Air Force Base at 11.20 a.m. The pilot was Bill Weaver, an experienced Lockheed test pilot. Jim Zweyer, a Lockheed Flight Test Reconnaissance and Navigation System Specialist, was in the rear. The two were investigating procedures designed to reduce trim drag and improve high Mach cruise performance. The latter involved flying with the plane configured with the center of gravity located further aft than normal. The first leg of the flight went normally and the SR-71 was refueled by a KC-130 tanker. Weaver increased the plane's speed to Mach 3.2 and climbed to 78,000 feet. Several minutes later, the right engine automatic inlet control system failed, requiring a switch to manual control. This was common in the early test phase of the aircraft. But as Weaver took the plane into a scheduled 35-degree bank turn to the right, the right engine suffered a dreaded inlet unstart. The resulting asymmetric thrust caused the plane to roll further right, increasing the bank to 60 degrees, and pitch up. Weaver yanked the control stick as far left as it would go, but it seemed to have no effect. Knowing the chances of surviving an ejection at Mach 3.18 and 78,800 feet was not very good, Weaver hoped to be able to get the plane to a lower altitude and speed to allow a safe ejection. He yelled for Zweyer to stay with the plane as they attempted to gain control, but the G-forces were so strong that the words came out garbled and unintelligible. Part of the problem was the nature of the test flight. Moving the center of gravity aft of normal specs reduced the Blackbird's longitudinal stability. Given the yaw from the inlet unstart, the reduced longitudinal stability combined with the increased angle from the turn and the speed and altitude, the cumulative forces simply exceeded the automatic system's ability to control the plane. The radical G-forces were beyond human limits, and Weaver and Zweyer lost consciousness, neither able to activate the ejection system. The airframe initially broke apart aft of the cockpit. SR-71, tail number 952, disintegrated in midair. Back at Edwards, the plane disappeared from radar, and they lost radio contact. The initial assessment was, was that the flight crew could not have survived such a violent breakup at that speed and altitude. When Bill Weaver woke up, he thought he was having a bad dream. His next thought was, no one could survive what just happened, therefore I must be dead. But as he became more aware, he could hear rushing wind and what sounded like straps flapping. He was alive and had somehow separated from the aircraft, despite not activating the ejection system. In fact, he had been thrown clear in the accident. His ejection seat was still with the wreckage of the plane, falling to earth at that very moment. The flight suit had apparently done its job, with the oxygen tank that was attached to the parachute harness inflating the suit to keep it pressurized. That was itself astounding, given the violence of the plane's breakup, and it was a good thing, otherwise Weaver's blood would be boiling. But the visor on his helmet was iced over, 
while I could tell that he was falling, he couldn't see. Air density at high altitude is insufficient to resist a body's tumbling motions, and centrifugal forces high enough to cause physical injury could develop quickly. The parachute system was supposed to initially deploy a small chute that should keep him from tumbling, but he couldn't be sure that it had deployed. As he had no idea how long he'd been unconscious, he didn't know how far up he was, or how long before he might experience the rapid deceleration caused by colliding with the Earth. But the small chute had deployed, and he was falling vertically. The main chute should open automatically at 15,000 feet, but he could not be sure the automatic systems were functioning. He tried to find the manual activation for the chute, but his hands were numb by cold, and with the suit inflated, he couldn't find it. But just then he felt the reassuring sudden deceleration caused by the opening of the main chute. He lifted the faceplate on his visor, only to find that the latch was broken and he had to hold it up. Given the plane's speed, he couldn't even be sure which state he was going to land in, and the ground below looked desolate. He could see the burning wreckage of the airplane on the ground some miles away. And most importantly, he was reassured to see Jim Zwayer's chute open some distance off. Despite being an experienced test pilot, Weaver had never actually jumped out of an airplane before. This was his first parachute landing, and he said it went okay, despite nearly landing on what appeared to be a very surprised antelope. Given the size that the search area must be, he figured he'd have to figure out how to survive the night before he could expect rescue, but on that count, he was wrong. He was busy trying to collapse his parachute while having to hold up his faceplate when he heard someone behind him say, Can I help you with that? It turns out the plane had broken apart over a New Mexico ranch owned by Albert J. Mitchell Jr. Mitchell and several ranch hands were branding colts when they heard a noise and saw parachutes descending from the sky several minutes later. Mitchell was a pilot and owned a small Hughes 300 helicopter and had immediately flown to where Weaver had landed. After helping Weaver collapse the chute, Mitchell flew to where Jim Zwayer's chute had landed, only to find that Zwayer was deceased. His neck had apparently snapped when the airplane broke up. After the accident, Weaver found out that the flapping noise that he'd been hearing as he was falling was because the heavy nylon straps that had strapped him into the aircraft had been shredded by the accident, and that shows how impressive it was that his flight suit held together through all of that. But he also found out that the oxygen tank that connected to his flight suit was connected by two tubes, and one had torn loose and the other was barely hanging on. If that second tube had torn loose, then the flight suit would not have inflated and he would have died. Albert Mitchell flew Weaver to the nearest hospital, which was in Tucumcari, New Mexico, and Weaver remembers being terrified because Mitchell kept the little helicopter speed above the red line for the entire trip, and Weaver was thinking how ironic it would be that if he survived falling out of an SR-71 at 78,000 feet, only to die in a little helicopter on the way to the hospital. Lockheed decided as a result of the accident to discontinue any testing of the SR-71 that put the center of gravity aft of specs, and they solved some other problems through aerodynamic means. And eventually a digital computer replaced the analog computer that controlled the air intakes, and those intake unstarts became much more rare. The Air Force retired the SR-71 in 1998, and NASA retired theirs in 1999, but there are persistent rumors that the Skunk Works is working on a successor to the SR-71 that some people claim will be twice as fast. In its 33 years of service, Jim Zwayer was the only SR-71 crew member to die in a flight accident. Bill Weaver was back flying SR-71s within a week, and eventually became Lockheed's chief test pilot. He retired and lives in Carlsbad, California. I hope you enjoyed this episode of The History Guy, short snippets of forgotten history between 10 and 15 minutes long. And if you did enjoy, please go ahead and click that thumbs up button. If you have any questions or comments or suggestions for future episodes, please write those in the comment section. I will be happy to personally respond. Be sure to follow The History Guy on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, and check out our merchandise on teespring.com. And if you'd like more episodes on forgotten history, all you need to do is subscribe.